Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The examination of the correctly articulated cast includes an evaluation of the central occlusion contacts, the functional and parafunctional areas of wear on the teeth, the working guidance on the left and right sides, the relationship of the opposing teeth on the balancing sides, and the protrusive guidance. The centric and eccentric occlusal contacts on the cast should duplicate the centric and eccentric occlusal contacts that were observed during the clinical examination. Cast mounted correctly on an individually adjustable articulator provide a fairly accurate reproduction of the occlusion in centric and eccentric positions. The articulator cannot exactly duplicate the patient's mandibular movements since the condylar elements of the articulator are not shaped like the temporomandibular joints. Some of the settings on the articulator are average values rather than the exact measurements of the patient. The casts are rigid and will not move when the articulator is closed in centric occlusion. However, the teeth will shift slightly during function due to the absorptive properties of the periodontal ligament. The neuromuscular reflex mechanisms that influence mandibular movements are not reproducible on the articulator. Despite the minor differences between the articulated cast and the patient, the occlusal evaluation of the articulated cast is invaluable for many reasons. The cast can be studied from the lingual as well as facial views. A diagnostic waxing can be done on cast prior to restoring or replacing carious and missing teeth. An occlusal adjustment can be done on the cast before adjusting the patient's occlusion. The occlusion can be evaluated at the operator's convenience without time restrictions or other patient limiting factors. To verify the accuracy of articulated cast, the centric occlusion stops are checked with shim stock. A good centric stop will hold shim stock when pulled between the teeth. If shim stock is easily drawn between the teeth, contact does not exist. Check the maxillary right first molar, cuspid, and central incisor carefully since these teeth will be waxed into functional occlusion. All three teeth should have at least one centric stop. There should be contacts between most of the opposing teeth if the casts are mounted correctly. If contact exists on both the left and right sides in the molar area and between at least two opposing anterior teeth, the mounting is acceptable. Failure to have bilateral contact or anterior and posterior contact will necessitate remounting the cast. Ideally, the mounted cast will have the same teeth contacting in centric occlusion that are contacting in the patient's mouth. The left cuspids will not contact in centric occlusion since these teeth did not contact during the clinical examination. Examine the individual contacts from the buckle. Lightly tap the teeth in centric occlusion. Watch as the mandibular buckle cusp tips occlude with the centric stops of the maxillary teeth. The exact positions of the contacts can be seen from this view. When the occlusal stops are checked with articulating paper, there may be several marks on a tooth. If there is doubt as to which marks are occluding in centric, looking at the cast from this view permits visualization of where the mandibular buccal cusps actually occlude with the opposing teeth. To examine exactly where the maxillary supporting cusps contact in centric, the casts are viewed from the lingual while lightly tapping the teeth together. Observe the location of the centric stop for the distal lingual cusp of the right maxillary first molar. Maintain this centric stop during the functional waxing exercise. Careful examination of how the maxillary supporting cusp move in and out of centric occlusion is not possible during the clinical examination. If narrow strips of shim stock are used to check individual maxillary supporting cusps for contact in centric, 
The accuracy of the placement of Shimstock can be verified from this view. All the centric stops should be marked with articulating paper. For purposes of demonstration, only the maxillary first molar centric stops will be marked with articulating paper. Centric occlusion contacts on the cast may not be exactly the same as those observed in the patient's mouth. The differences are explained in part by mounting errors. Hand articulating the cast in centric should result in a close approximation of the patient's centric occlusion even though it will not be exactly the same. The teeth also shift a little when squeezed into centric occlusion due to the elasticity of the periodontal ligament. The cast, however, will not squeeze together when brought into occlusion. The contacts are seen on the mesiolingual cusp, oblique ridge, and distal marginal ridge. Be sure to check which mandibular supporting cusps occlude with each centric stop. The graphic demonstrates areas on the occlusal and lingual surfaces of the teeth that result in stable centric contacts. These areas are located in central fossae, between two marginal ridges, in mesial and distal fossae, or on a single marginal ridge of the posterior teeth. Stable stops are located on the cingulum or marginal ridges of the anterior teeth. Contacts on inclined planes are not stable. Contacts on inclined planes produce lateral forces on the teeth, which can be damaging to the periodontium. Stable contacts direct the forces of occlusion along the long axis of the teeth. The arrangement of the periodontal fibers are designed to withstand occlusal forces directed along the long axis of the teeth. Wear facets are the historical record of a person's occlusion. All the teeth should be examined for wear facets before starting the functional waxing exercise. The facet on the maxillary left cuspid is formed by the mandibular left cuspid during the left working excursion. The left working guidance should remain on this cuspid wear facet when the functional waxing is completed. The wear facet on the maxillary left second molar is formed upon closure into centric occlusion. The steep occlusal anatomy and prominent triangular ridge on the mesiobuccal cusp necessitated some wear during function in order for the large distobuccal cusp of the opposing molar to have sufficient room during closure into centric. The wear facet on the mandibular left second molar is a balancing side contact. This wear facet is formed by the mesiolingual cusp of the maxillary left second molar during a right working excursion. The incisal pin should be raised to examine the occlusion during lateral and protrusive excursions. Be very careful when moving the upper member of the articulator to avoid wear on the casts. Move the articulator into right working. The mesiobuccal cusp of the maxillary first molar moves between the buccal cusps of the mandibular first molar. The distal buccal cusp of the maxillary first molar contacts the mandibular first molar initially, then moves between the distal buccal and distal cusps. This contact should not be replaced during the waxing exercise, since heavy contact would be an interference preventing cuspid guidance. Cuspid guidance allows for smooth mandibular movements. In wide working, the incisors contact. Check the working side from the lingual. The maxillary lingual cusps move between the mandibular teeth or between the lingual cusps of the molars. Contact between the opposing lingual cusps during working are considered interferences. The guidance between the cuspids results in disocclusion of the supporting cusps during the working excursion. In wide working, the incisors on the working side occlude when the cuspids have moved past an end-to-end -end relationship and can no longer contact. Ideally, there will be no contacts on the left side or balancing side. 
The clearance is easily observed between the bicuspids and first molar. Contact does exist between the second molars. Notice how the mesiolingual cusp of the maxillary second molar contacts the wear facet on the mandibular second molar that we examined earlier. Balancing side contacts are not desirable and should be eliminated during the diagnostic waxing. The left working and right balancing movements should be examined on your own cast, even though time does not permit for such a thorough examination on this TV tape. Guidance on the working side during lateral excursions and on the anterior teeth in protrusion results in smooth mandibular movements and does not necessitate complicated neuromuscular responses to avoid posterior interferences. The guidance switches between the left and right incisors during the protrusive movement. Since the contact is not even on all the incisors, the protrusive movement is not smooth. This can be partially corrected when the maxillary right central incisor is waxed into occlusion. Guidance should be waxed on the maxillary right central incisor in harmony with the guidance on the left central incisor. The posterior supporting cusps disocclude as soon as the protrusive movement begins. As long as the anterior teeth are occluding in centric occlusion, the disocclusion of the posterior supporting cusps will begin immediately. The contacts between the mandibular incisors and the lingual surfaces of the maxillary teeth are best observed from the lingual. The contour of the lingual surface of the anterior teeth when waxed into functional occlusion should allow for smooth contacts between all the anterior teeth and also provide disocclusion in the posterior. Since the supporting cusps move parallel to the occlusal sulci, the disocclusion of posterior teeth is generally easy to achieve unless the individual tooth position is poor or the curve of spee is accentuated. Poor individual tooth position is usually caused by drifting and tipping of teeth after extractions when prosthetic replacements are not constructed. The analysis of the articulated cast familiarizes the dentist with the occlusion prior to dental treatment, whether the problem requires correction via orthodontics, prosthodontics, periodontics, oral surgery, occlusal splint therapy, or occlusal adjustment. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.